Good afternoon. We are a little bit late getting started because the preceding plenary session was a little late getting started and a little late to ending. Uh, but I hope that you've had an opportunity to, uh, to mingle and to get a coffee and you're ready for some interesting uh, presentations this afternoon. Uh, so welcome to the concurrent sessions on road safety. My name is Cash Ram. I'm a Director General of Motor, Motor Vehicle Safety with Transport Canada, uh, headquartered in Ottawa. And I'm also the, uh, the board member, the uh, board member on the chair uh, of, the, uh, uh, of the board of CCMTA. I will be your moderator for today's session. There are three presentations in this session. And uh, all together, including the three presentations, the introductions, and the questions and answers, it'll last approximately one hour. And we will necessarily go into the break between this session and the next one, just because we started late. And uh, because, um, because we're, we have three interesting presentations, uh, we're, uh, we're going to, uh, we're going to have the Q's and A's at the very end. So I would request you not to applaud after every presentation and to wait until all the three presentations have been delivered and then we can applaud. We will have a Q's and A session at, uh, which will be collective at the end of the three presentations uh, with our guest speakers. Um, so with that, a little caution to the people in the audience. I, I think you're here because you're interested in the subject and you're probably brimming with questions. And I would request that you jot down your question. Uh, during the course of the three presentations, uh, you may want to jot down the, uh, the, the, the slide. Uh, a lot of the slides aren't numbered though, but if, if, if they are or if you know, if you can identify the slide, uh, to jot down uh, that slide if you want to make reference to a slide. You don't have to. And that'll help you pose the question at the end of the session to the, to the speaker. Now, you're also welcome to pose general questions which would apply to the panel and we'll go make the rounds of the three members of the panel and give them a, an opportunity in turn to respond to, your, uh, to the generic kind of questions. Uh, so the, uh, the session is the road to autom autonomous vehicles, the road to autonomous vehicles as opposed to autonomous vehicles in general. And to discuss this topic, we have three co-presenters, and, uh, and I forewarned them that each of them has about 13 minutes, uh, actually only exactly 13 minutes each, and I'm going to be ruthless in, in keeping them to time. The first presenter is Mr. Barry Gander, co-founder of iCanada. For 25 years, Barry has helped jumpstart the development of advanced technology organizations in Canada and abroad. Uh, working with companies, associations, the public sector, and academia, Barry has established a network of leaders who thrive on cutting-edge initiatives. As uh, Executive Vice President of Canada's largest high-tech association, which is CATA, uh, Barry has helped showcase the best of Canadian innovation to global markets. The iCanada program, which he co-founded, aims to in create an intelligent nation by establishing a grassroots movement of communities that network at ultra-fast speed. Through his program, Barry works in some 50 cities, having established a governor's council that is headed by a premier who is assisted by mayors and CEOs of large companies. He has authored several best-selling books and created new social networks utilizing novel technologies and tools. So without much ado and without applause, if you will please, We'll go right to, <laughs> right to the presentation. Thank so you very much. I welcome you to the lecture. Thank you very much. It's the part about the no applause that's possibly bendable as a rule. But I uh, have come in uh, from Ottawa just now. I had 15 minutes to spare in my timing. And an autonomous vehicle would have been really handy on that road. Um, I do want to introduce you to this fun world, in fact. Um, we have um, something that everybody is interested in in the general public. I wrote an article in the CAA magazine a few months ago on how cars can drive without you. And the response to it was very warm, very, very positive. I think a lot of people are looking forward to what happens with an autonomous vehicle. And I'll share with you right now what the world looks like 
to an autonomous vehicle. This is the Google car. This is what it sees. It sees, in a wireframe sense, computations that look at all of these surround the um, moving vehicles, the uh, objects on the sidewalks. It tracks a moving ball, for example, bouncing between cars because the computer is programmed to know that a child might follow that ball coming across the road towards the car. And the interesting thing from my point of view, from the uh, computer side, the digital side, is that these cars generate about a gigabit of information every second. And we're looking forward to a world where tens of thousands of these are going to be running around the streets, each of them generating a gigabit of information about the streets, about the cars, about the networking between the cars. Um, it's going to be a different world of transportation, as you can, you can see. Um, the fact is, and I'll have to read some of this out to you because I doubt very much whether you can see it from there. Oops, pardon me. But the potential saving in the United States alone from having autonomous vehicles is estimated to be easily 300 to 400 billion dollars a year. Um, there will be almost 5 million fewer accidents, almost 30,000 fewer deaths, 2 million fewer injuries, 400 billion in accident-related cost savings, and the um, uh, savings in, in uh, gasoline, for example, um, almost 2 billion gallons of gas saved at $100 billion cost, uh, $5 billion of fewer commuting hours, roughly. And the, the map on the top there with the percentages shows you what the public acceptance level is of autonomous vehicles at the moment. And that's, this is before any of them are on the street sh really showing what, what can happen with them. Um, Canada is uh, not doing too badly, a little over half, but America a little bit better at 60%. Um, Brazil at uh, 94%. You'll find, in fact, and a curious thing here, that the more developed the country is, uh, the less it uh, is uh, confident about autonomous vehicles. Um, developing countries um, want them and want them badly. I used to live in Saudi Arabia, and I can see exactly why you'd want an autonomous vehicle in a place like that. So the fact is that um, the, the time that the, the public perception is right for this to happen. And I draw your attention to something when I was doing the research for the CAA piece. Um, of course, I'll, I'll point the, the general fact is that the autonomous vehicle is now legal in three states already. California, Florida, and Nevada, which kind of throws out my case, but, but it's uh, <laughs> three very populous states. Um, one of the interesting things that I was just chatting with my, my friends here about is the prevalence of car trains, which is a part way towards autonomous vehicle step, where the cars drive about a meter apart or two, and you can see that in Holland quite a bit where they're experimenting with this. The, the car trains, hundreds of vehicles, they don't drive very fast, uh, maybe 100 kilometers an hour, but they drive steadily, there's no accordion movement back and forth. And uh, this video, I could send people a link if they're interested, is really interesting. Obviously the guy's hey no hands kind of thing. Um, you see in the video, he gets into the car, he sits down, he tells it to go to Taco Bell because it's voice activated. The car starts up and heads off to Taco Bell. It's only halfway through the video that you realize this guy is blind, totally blind. And with autonomous vehicles, of course, yes, you can do that. You can be, the blind shall drive again. That's the world we're going into. It's going to be wonderful. And I'll, I'll not stop with this, actually. This is the Network Vehicle Association that uh, I'm with. But let me plug this straight in. This is a vivid illustration. Maybe you've seen this before. Of the networked world. This is the papal election in 2005. Nice crowd. You can see in the bottom right-hand corner, somebody's got a, a phone that they're taking a picture with. This is the last one. <laughs> 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 and in fact, the mobile cloud that comes out of that is the key to all cars. Cars are now being bought not on their brand, but on their networking capability. That's the first time in 100 years that that has happened, that something has knocked the brand off the, off the, off the stage for the cars. Um, six billion world subscribers to uh, mobile devices, and it transforms the car equation. 80% of the innovation in a car today is devoted to the ICT side of it and uh, the vehicle is the third fastest connected device in growth in the world. So there's something new happening here. Um, when the cloud hits the road, as it were, and goes into autonomous vehicles, you can see differences in car design with a smaller central console, 
uh, better drive dynamics, higher safety levels. Uh, the driving experience will be, of course, uh, totally different with uh, optimization of distances between cars, um, the personalized data that travels with you, uh, the, the health aspect will be uh, almost built into it for you, wearing seat belts that have um, uh, sensors for your heart rate and things like that uh, to uh, shut down the cars if you're starting to have a heart attack or call a police car. And the infrastructure is now being put into place by companies like uh, IBM and, uh, and, uh, and, and others around the world. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm going through this very quickly because the 13 minutes I can feel the breathing down my neck. But uh, um, the basics, um, a user interface that's intuitive. Um, if you're looking for an application, does it uh, meet or exceed the customer needs? Uh, one of the best companies going for knowing these kinds of things is QNX, which is in Ottawa. Um, we were just chatting about that earlier. Um, uh, very few Canadians have heard about this, but it's the, it's the software that's in all of the GM cars. This is huge. It's worldwide. It's one of those things where a, a Canadian company has won a, a worldwide gold medal, and the Canadians are determined to have it bronzed. It's, it's just an amazing thing. Uh, where are the activities now? Um, just to flow back to my earlier diagram, I won't uh, read that. You can read that yourselves. But... Uh, Later this year, Volvo will be introducing a steer assist where you, the car automatically follows a vehicle ahead of you. Audi will follow with uh, that plus um, autonomous steering and braking. Uh, so the steer assist is, is followed by an active um, uh, control system. Then Cadillac uh, next year is coming out with a lane guidance um, addition to that. And uh, Nissan is adding unoccupied parking to that so you get out of your car and you press a button and the car will then park itself. So these are all very interesting things coming on us very fast. The point is that it, it's coming on very, very fast. This isn't the rate of speed you see in the automotive industry where things actually change relatively slowly. Now the automotive industry is having to follow the pace of the digital industry, which is very much faster by a factor of seven. So you'll, you'll see these things tumbling into your car very, very quickly and the world will change that much faster. So the idea with having uh, an autonomous vehicle is to surround the car occupant with the social network and the global knowledge while the driving is left to the digital system and the computer. So the car interior is, is just your friend delivering all your networks, all your contacts, all your news, health, travel, and environmental control to you as you move on basically what is a computer on wheels that's taking you to different places. And I think I'd better stop there because I can go on and on, but is that close to 13? You've got time. <laughs> Do I? You, you devil. <laughs> oh, good. One of the places where this is uh, going to be most effective is with first responders, the police, the ambulance drivers, and new technologies, of course, are being developed there. They'll be rolled out that will be hugely impactful in what they're doing. Um, I don't know whether uh, this is of uh, 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 knowledge to you, but LTE, long-term evolution, it's called, is a very high bandwidth uh, system being unveiled across cities. It's supported by all the service providers, and it's got uh, super strong security, and it will be continuously evolving. So that's what we see as the basis of the technology for first responders. Uh, some of the uses, uh, real-time video between two vehicles, going down the road to autonomous police vehicles, uh, exchanging video with each other, and with uh, sights so that a police car driving to the scene of a robbery at a Max Milk will be using the camera inside the Max Milk to see what's going on before his car gets there. Um, and let's see, mobile office, uh, the digital signage um, for the um, various first responders to keep it secure, and of course, to be able to respond in cases of emergency with um, a sort of an, an ultra-reliable shift in modal communications as, as systems collapse, as it were. Um, now, we have put together some test environments uh, for LTE and the first responders and um, autonomous vehicles. We had uh, uh, several people coming up from the states from uh, Alcatel-Lucent, for example, and uh, they put on um, a live video demonstration for us with uh, some demonstrations of facial recognition and mass casualty monitoring um, and real-time video tracking. That, that was uh, extremely interesting and uh, very invigorating, in fact, to see yourself being recognized when you didn't know you were on the system. Now, Harris Corporation also put something together. 
with uh, high bandwidth uh, public service applications and uh, um, a, a ruggedized smartphone. There's a, a shot of the live video in action. Facial recognition um, also taking over. Uh, the mass casualty monitoring system. Um, the <coughs> GPS tracking uses, uh, as you might guess, a geofencing environment, so you can define where you want to have the identification done of the vehicles or the cars or the people within a little block area. And it could be as big as Toronto, because Toronto already tracks all the cell phones being used in the city, uh, not from the point of view of identification, but to know where a device is being moved. So there are millions of those um, uh, tracking data bits every day that the city gathers to find out what the traffic is like in the city. Um, and you could shrink that to a city block, uh, like the area or the area around, say, Ryerson, to find out how the traffic is flowing there. Um, and it, uh, it could be between communities. So as you're moving from one community to the next, you could automatically have data called up for you in your car about what's going to be happening in the community that you're getting to, handy if you're on vacation as well as handy if you're trying to avoid a traffic situation. And let me see, multimedia access across LTE. Well, of course, you'd be able to use any kind of uh, system across uh, an LTE network. And I think I've made it now under 13. You did. You reached that factor of 12. So you <laughs> I'll, I'll let you spend the, uh, the extra minute in any way you want. But <laughs> thank you very much. <laughs> schedule. Appreciate that. Thank you, Barry. Now, okay, our second speaker is Mr. Bone Tritter, Chair of ITS Canada, uh, ITS Canada's Connected Vehicle Technical Committee. Uh, Bowen was trained as a communications engineer and has specialized in communications for transportation applications. He's worked in a variety of fields of intelligent, intelligent transportation services for over 35 years. He has extensive experience in urban traffic control systems, freeway transportation management systems, um, transit and fleet management systems, open road toll systems, and dedicated short range communications. His experience in the early deployment of open road tolling for Highway 407 developed into interest in vehicle to roadside communications and open communication standards. and. Um, Bowen has participated in a variety of North American and international standards bodies. He's an active member of ITS Canada and the chair of its Connected Vehicle Subcommittee. And uh, if we do have his presentation loaded. Oh, it's okay. <laughs> Mr. Bob talks is fast. <laughs> and I don't have any slides, but that's what we're going to be here. So I'm going to be faster. So, Bob, you've you got a very short presentation. So, six slides is all. Well, I don't have any slides. Oh. I thought we were going to be on shorter. Oh, okay. So, there isn't a presentation. That's a little unfortunate, okay. Perhaps while we're waiting for this, you just go through Bob's introduction. Or through Bob. That's probably a very good idea. So let's... Uh, or read mine again. The, the, the <laughs> <laughs> well, it's the least I could do to repay you for, for, for giving me back the minute. <laughs> okay. And if uh, people haven't noticed, uh, it's the three Bs. Bob, Bowen, and Barry. Yeah. <laughs> so I might as well uh, give you an intro to Bob. Bob, uh, oops, you've got it. Okay, so you've got the lectern. Let's see if I can make the mouse work too. If not, you might have hit return point. Yeah, no, it's not working. I guess um, I think to talk about what I'm talking about here, which is basically connected vehicles. And um, Barry gave a sort of overview of autonomous vehicles, a little bit of connected vehicles in there. I'm going to try to focus a little more on strictly connected vehicles. So that's what are connected vehicles, what they're connected to, and 
trying to sort of define the terms a little bit because we can get carried away. What's, what's a connected vehicle? What's not a connected vehicle? What's an autonomous vehicle? What's a self-driving car? Like, is a car that parks itself autonomous or not? Like, that's sort of, so it's, I think some of the definitions we like to try to, I like to try to clarify anyway. And a little background and, and some current perspectives. And a little bit of stuff is going on in the Canadian perspective. And I'm not sure of the audience, so I'm just gonna, just gonna go with it. My background, I'm a communications engineer, so I'm, I sometimes get bogged down in some of the details, but I apologize in advance. Um, so when we talk about connected vehicles, we really talk about three types of connectivity. One is the vehicle talking to the infrastructure, talking to traffic signal lights, talking to rail signals, talking to the infrastructure. So it's communications, high-speed communications between the, the vehicle and the infrastructure. Uh, so that's the first type. The second type is when the, you were talking about earlier, the vehicles talking to each other. So if you're tailgating somebody or your, your, your turn lights are changing, so the vehicle to vehicle infrastructure. And the third time, which is sort of called connected vehicle to the infrastructure, connected vehicle to the, the, the global network or to a server, which frankly I'm not really sure is connected vehicles at all, is the uh, called V2X. And people disagree with me, but that's okay. <laughs> so, <laughs> people? <laughs> um, so, the first one, the connect, the, the vehicle to roadside. So one of, one of the applications, and I'm just going to have a few applications here, and I, I did steal this from some ITS Canada uh, training material. Uh, actually, G4 apps, I think. On this slide, yeah. Yes, thank you. Um, so basically, the idea is that you have a, a, a vehicle which communicates with the traffic signal lights. So the traffic signal lights communicates in broadband fashion. Hey, we're turning amber, we're turning red, and... So there can be some interaction between the vehicle, either the slow down, speed up, or an interaction with the intersection controller to say, oh, better, better sort of balance this and, and continue uh, doing something different, a different plan, a different operation. So that's, that's one of the applications. It also works for emergency vehicles, particularly for like, uh, yeah, particularly for emergency vehicles, because then you can actually control the lights and the intersection can say, hey, there's a, there's a police car coming, stop. And the vehicle knows there's a police car coming, stop. So that's one example. Um, another example is the vehicle-to-vehicle -vehicle infrastructure. So, so you know what the car in front of you is doing? And in your example about vehicles going in a platoon where they're tailgating each other. So the car one can communicate with car two so that they can know how fast they're going, whether the vehicle in front is, is braking, whether, whether or not they're turning left, turning right, uh, so there's communication between the vehicles, which get, then gets um, communicated to the driver. And that actually um, integrates with the autonomous vehicle, where the, the vehicle itself senses the, senses the car in front of them, but as well as that, the communications actually provides the information of what the car is doing. So with an autonomous vehicle, all the vehicles don't have to be communicating with each other, so the vehicle in front will recognize the, the vehicle behind it, or so forth and back forth. So um, the vehicle-to-vehicle -vehicle communications in an ideal world when we have sufficient population of vehicles to uh, enable that, we provide very efficient um, traffic management systems. And again, we'll, we'll um, um, be compatible with the autonomous vehicles. And uh, I guess the other thing is, is really this allows a lot more more efficient use of the roadways, better optimization of traffic signals. Oh, wrong way. Now, I talked about the, the, what I consider the real connected vehicles, which is the, the two examples before. But in the broader community, people talk about connected vehicles. We've been talking about it for a long time. And if you have a, a fleet of, of commercial trucks or taxi cabs, are they connected because they have a central dispatcher? You know, so in sort of a little broader definition, if you have a taxi fleet, they could be connected because the dispatcher knows where they all are. Uh, I'm not so sure that's really what I consider connected vehicles, but other people will argue. Um, as the vehicles become more integrated, as the standards are developed, things like fleet management for trucks and buses, particularly, um, will 
will be more tightly integrated and a greater advantage every time you add another, another vehicle with the same type of um, communications infrastructure. For example, right now we have a, uh, a bus approaching a traffic light. You can get an, change the tra traffic plan to improve the optimization of that traffic signal. But it uses a totally proprietary technology. So it's acting totally independent. It connects with the traffic signal controller. The traffic signal controller does something based on that interaction. If you happen to have a, a fire truck coming the other direction, that's another totally different system, which also interacts with the traffic signal controller. So at some point, we have really standardized connected vehicles. These multiple systems will act together as a more integrated system to make sense of all the data which is available. Um, the other broader definition is like navigation and mapping services. I, I'm still not sure what, if I have my GPS enabled smartphone in my car, is my car connected? I don't know. Um, maybe, maybe not. But that's, as, as, the, as the standards develop, we get more and more um, advantageous interaction between the different types of services. Location-based services, Gabe Barry talked about, which is basically the classic example is you're going by Tim Hortons, I feel like a coffee, so I usually stop at Tim Hortons, so, oh, by the way, it's 9 o'clock in the morning, you're going by Tim Hortons, you want a coffee? Beep, beep. That's the traditional commercial message for location-based services. And that's really on GPS, but also relies upon uh, communications with your vehicle. Um, now, within the last few years, the vehicle manufacturers have sort of got involved in connected vehicles like crazy, you know. Um, for a long time there, you, you couldn't seem to get them interested. And then all of a sudden, they're, every time you, you look at the manufacturers, they're a connected vehicle. No, what's a connected vehicle? Some of the manufacturers say, oh, I got a connected vehicle because I can upload your, your software in, in the car dynamically. Well, that's connected. Another one will say, I got a connected vehicle because I can let your kids watch uh, Walt Disney movies in the back seat. That's connected too. Um, so the, the vehicles are becoming more and more smart in terms of their infrastructures and their interfaces. At one time, they were very proprietary. And now they're becoming much more open. Um, companies like QNX, which we referred to earlier, um, provide a standard interface, provide standard operating systems. Um, so now you have a, a more media center focused. So the, you have a console which does everything. Instead of having to stick your GPS thing in the window, you stick your toll tag on that window, stick this in that window, right? It's all, it's all done through the integrated, or will be all done through the integrated console. Uh, oh yeah, remote vehicle monitoring I mentioned earlier. That's one of the sort of things which, we keep hearing about the, G, you know, the well, multiple recalls recently, you start thinking, well, if they can monitor the, the status of the vehicles and who's got what versions where, um, and they can provide some sort of alert or remote updates, that's a, you know, the functionality. But again, is that connected? Uh, sort of, maybe. Oops. So this is the way I sort of, again, this came from an ITS Canada uh, training slide, but I kind of like it, because what it talks about is it tries to define what we mean by the, by the different uh, applications and some of the criteria as far as communications. And the ones that I think are really important are the orange ones. These are the ones which require uh, high guaranteed delivery. So if, if you're approaching an intersection and the light changes and you want a, a message for that, or if you're an emergency vehicle approaching an intersection, you want to make sure that message gets through. You better, better get you through before the light turns red, right? So, they're short messages, they're highly critical, and these are the real-time safety messages. And actually, uh, I'm not sure if I know the slide on that, but these are, these are the ones which bandwidth has been allocated by the FCC and by, um, and by, uh, not Transfer Canada, CRTC, <laughs> sorry, thank you, <laughs> to, um, to provide the services in the 5.9 um, megahertz range. The other ones are, are less, less uh, time critical. Um, so they can be handled by some of the commercial services, like the LTE services. They also have, tend to have a, a larger bandwidth requirement. So if you're going to watch a movie, you need a lot more bandwidth than you're just saying, hey, the light's turning red. So, so there's a couple different criteria there, and it gets a little confusing is what we really mean by connected vehicles. 
Um, okay, and over the years, there's been a lot of activity in, 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 in connected vehicles. I remember in the early days, was toll transponders were connected vehicle. You, you bought this RCU with your, your car, mm -hmm. and that was connected vehicle. And, and the people in the toll industry didn't like that term because they thought, hey, it's just an OBU. It's just something we stick in the car. It's a toll transponder. Um, but over the years, there have been a lot of standardization activities. And I think one of the, the key aspects of the standardization is not, not only the, the definition of what the standards are, but a vastly increased breadth of what's included in the standard. It used to be just, oh, toll transponder. Now it's including all these other messages, a whole host of security. It's taken up quite a few years. Um, there was diversion paths in North America and, and Europe and Japan. Uh, gradually, they've converged so I'll, under ISO. Um, so now there is a more of a general international consensus. So there have been projects in both Europe and North America uh, using connected vehicles. So I guess the, the, the key point is it started talking about toll tags. It's moved to a sort of standard organization, which was a camel. It took a hell of a long time to get anywhere. But the result was a much more robust um, set of applications, which may or may not be actually um, come to fruition. But at least the standards are there. And um, it also works. And now the vehicle manufacturers are getting on board with this sort of stuff as well. Um, this is an example of a, a pilot project which is done by the USDOT. It's basically a, a pilot test of a bunch of connected vehicles. They, they demonstrated the stuff works and they communicated between the vehicles. And I don't know, I can talk about it more, but I think that's enough. Uh, oops. And then I guess we talked a little bit earlier about connected vehicles and autonomous vehicles, and they are com compatible, I think. So the connected vehicle can provide information between the autonomous vehicles, which vehicles are around the corner, who's doing what, where. <coughs> can provide map updates and stuff like that. We talked about vehicle firmware, um, firmware updates. So when you integrate the, the, the sensors on the vehicle with the communications between the vehicles, it's not just a one plus two. It becomes a, um, maybe not exponential, but a multiplying factor in there as well. And a whole bunch of stakeholders. Um, this is just a few of the ones which we've identified through ITS Canada. It's a little out of date, I don't know. Um, but the, the, it's, it's becoming really, a lot of people are getting on the bandwagon now. Um, we don't all have the same opinions as things. We don't all talk in the same way. But I think the, the community is, is growing. And through sessions like this, I think we're providing a, a better opportunity for everyone to understand what the other people are talking about. And that's it. How was time? Oh, you're, you're right on. <laughs> I didn't even try. I didn't even try. Thank you. Appreciate that. Now, our third speaker is Bob Burrows, and un unfortunately, uh, we, uh, well, my apology, we, we can't, uh, we, we don't have his file, his PowerPoint file, and so Bob will be, uh, will be flying on, uh, on, on, on the basis of his notes. Uh, Bob is... CEO of G4 Apps and Executive Committee member of the uh, Automotive Parts Manufacturers Association's Connected Vehicles Working Group with a degree in electrical engineering from the University of Waterloo and a Master of Science degree in business from uh, MIT. Bob has spent his career in executive marketing and R&D positions in the telecommunications and automotive industries. He's held, a, he's held worldwide product line responsibility with Motorola been the founding sales and technology executive for a national wireless provider, the CEO of a startup, and the founder and GM of uh, Vectrix, a software-intensive automotive safety system subsidiary of Magna. A pioneer in connected vehicles, in 2006, Bob formed G4 Apps to bring connected vehicle safety systems to automotive tier one suppliers and OEMs. Today, G4 Apps focuses on hybrid road agency smart vehicle solutions for improving traffic flow, mobility, fuel use, and commercial fleet operation with leading edge attention to driver distraction and adherence to safety requirements from the perspectives of both vehicles and road agencies. 
Bob is an advisor to the US DOT on traffic flow optimization based on connected vehicles and a founding member of the connected vehicle uh, working group of, uh, of APMA, where he serves on the executive committee for the group. So without any ado, over to Bob. Thanks, Cash. I don't know if you're lucky or unlucky that I don't have my slides, so <laughs> maybe I'll talk less without them. Um, I'm going to take a little bit of a different tack away from technology and more into benefits and at least my opinion of what you people can do to make it all safer for us. Um, technology is underway. Um, you know, as the last speaker on Foresight said, you know, look at the possibilities. I don't think, I think you would be very hard put to find any of the scenarios that doesn't include autonomous or connected vehicles. So this is like looking at the internet in 1988, accept that it's real, move forward, embrace it, and that's how you do the most for your organizations and for all of us on the road. Um, so uh, before I get a little bit more into that, I just want to kind of hang up two sticky notes here to think about, and I'll come back to both of them. Uh, the first is in 2010, when Toyota had all the massive recalls, there were Senate hearings. And uh, NHTSA ad admitted they were caught off guard a bit by it, um, but they had zero software engineers on their staff. Zero. Out of, out of 125 engineers. So they admitted that maybe they should move forward, and, and as you'll see, well, as you'll hear, uh, they've made some very big steps forward on that. So that's one thing to think about. The other thing is I, I think back to seat belts. You know, we didn't invent them, but Canadian jurisdictions were some of the first with primary regulation to force them, and they're part of our heritage and having some of the safest roads in North America. So this comes back, I'm gonna talk a little bit about national versus provincial jurisdiction uh, as well, because of big roles to be played here in, in bringing things forward. So I guess the, um, uh, Bowen talked a bit about the US DOT program. That is a program underway to have connectivity in, in all vehicles. And when all vehicles get that technology, we're looking to reduce accidents and fatalities by over 80%. Uh, a windfall, you know, clearly. Um, that's when all vehicles get there. Uh, but, and sometimes I talk to groups and everybody makes the assumptions, well, we'll only plan for when all the vehicles are there and we'll say how good it's gonna be, but we won't deal with the, how we're gonna get there, what happens in between. How do we encourage car number 22 to move to that so that car number 25 gets some benefits and all those sorts of things? And those are some of the things that I wanna talk about because these are roles that we have, just like we do seat belts. How do we encourage the people to use them? And for this, it's even more important because for collision avoidance to work, the more people, it's like the internet, you know, the first person gets nothing. <laughs> it, it's more valuable the more people you have. So as agencies and as industry, yeah. oh, good job. <laughs> System works, how far along you wanna go by? Uh, <laughs> let's, uh, let's stop here. Thank you. Thank you, everybody, for uh, making that happen. So I'm going to come back around to this networking, and I, by that I don't mean communications network. I mean people networking and vehicles networking together. Uh, but I want to talk a little bit about how we get from here to there. On the left-hand side, we have some vehicle-centric technologies. So these are new technologies that are going in, and they're going to keep going. They're not going to say, oh, connected vehicles are here. We're not going to do it. The things like adaptive cruise control, collision mitigation, blind spot detection, lane departure warning, lane, lane keeping is more aggressive where you actually help the car stay in the lane as opposed to just warn the driver. And that, uh, as you can imagine, plays out different in different jurisdictions of the world depending on liability, uh, more so than technology. Um, and then you got some simple things. And the industry, uh, the automotive industry is very safety conscious. We've done things like heads up display. Uh, gesture control, you'll actually see down in the, in the vehicle we have on the floor voice recognition. Another thing you'll see in the, on the floor down below, we have alcohol detection built into the car. Uh, and it's actually, it is connected. You'll be able to uh, see that your 
son or daughter you know, blew over the limit and was parked outside the bar, if you, that's how far you want to go. Or the, the, there's various uh, things that could be done. Then there's the real-time vehicle-to-vehicle, V2I, and, and in uh, Bowen's uh, slides, those are the one in orange. If I'm going to have sub-second response, every car has to have some sub-second communications, signal violation, all that. But there's also near-time stuff that we can do today with LTE. If we, if we can detect that there's cues, let's warn people downstream that there's cues. They don't have to know within a half a second. If we let them know, in fact, we want to let them know 10 seconds ahead. Or we might want to let them know four kilometers ahead so they take another route. So these things are all available technically. They can all be done. Everybody in the industry is scared to do anything because of driver distraction. And this is one of the places where, I, where uh, I think there's been some tremendous work done by NHTSA. Next slide, please. Uh, can you go back one? Oh, sorry. Um, I think I'm missing a slide here. There. This is, uh, NHTSA came, it went from no software engineers in 2010 to 2012, putting out a uh, request for uh, feedback from the automobile manufacturers. And their jurisdiction is new cars. So they get to tell the, new, the automobile manufacturers what has to go in every new car. So if you look at, at the dash, that screen, they set out to make that safe. No fonts too small, no rolling maps, no all sorts of, they put lots of work into that. And the very interesting thing, they realize that the more vehicles that are on the road with connected technology done well, the better off everybody is, are. So they're very purposely, you can't read it at the bottom, they said, basically, we don't have jurisdiction over other people, but we very much hope that aftermarket manufacturer makers or smartphone app makers or that, if they're going to put anything in the car, follow these guidelines. And for a government agency to step out and make a suggestion like that, I think is, is pretty tremendous. It shows not only their level of technical expertise in doing that, but their level of knowledge and desire to make it work. And if any of you haven't read these guidelines, I'd, I'd encourage you to do it because it comes back to aftermarket or driver distraction, that's provincial jurisdiction. So it's up to you guys to figure out and do it, make sure it's done safely, but please don't just wait for five years for it, it to happen and come back to us because there are incremental things that can be done once we get past this boogeyman. This is uh, my last slide of substance. I do have one more ad. <laughs> um, if you look at safety, mobility, and sustainability, they all, they all get wrapped together. If we prevent accidents, we have better traffic flow, we, we use less fuel. So number one thing is to, for safety. Now, in order to make this happen, to get the community seated, to get it going, we have a few dimensions. We have coverage. You know, it would be much better off, instead of making one intersection perfect at $100,000, how do I make 100 of them pretty good for $1,000 so that the drivers now start to see value? They don't see value at one intersection. So think of that on a wider scale. The next thing is you think really about the fleets. Um, there's personal fleet, there's commercial, there's transit and there's government fleets. It's all about getting the most players on the road. An easy thing to do might be take technology, once you feel it's safe, put it in all the government vehicles. That starts to get some seated. It starts to show people that you believe in driver distraction in the way that it's implemented for these and, and get something going. One of the things that, that USDOT is very straightforward about is looking at when the connected vehicle is gonna hit new cars in 2018, maybe a couple of years before that, they force it into commercial vehicles or transit vehicles where they have jurisdiction over in order to get eight or 10 million vehicles out there already part of the game so that when the first private vehicle comes off the, the parking lot, it has somebody to play with. So these are all levers that, that you people have. Then you come down to the bottom uh, and there's different technologies to get it in and maybe you need different policies or regulation for each of those. OEM embedded, you know, what does Ford have to put in? Well, that generally is, is Transport Canada and stuff. Aftermarket, you know, the provinces get to say what should go in the trucks. Uh, can you start to encourage some of these technologies that interact to go into the trucks or carry-in? 
you know, I said NHTSA, they looked at all of them and they made statements about all of them. So I think for provincial agencies, there may be different groups within the agencies, but how do we collaborate in, in looking at those towards our goal of getting more vehicles on the road, playing with each other so we get, we get safety sooner and we get people want to join in sooner, that they start to see the benefits. It's like uh, you know, joining LinkedIn now as opposed to three years ago, that people want to do that. And then lastly, I told you that was my last slide of substance. Um, I'm here today representing the Automotive Parts Manufacturers Association of Canada. And in the spirit of this sense, so just with welcome you to drop by the car. What we've done here is Toyota North America gave us a, a vehicle. We worked with QNX to do the integration and we found, actually we had 30 Canadian companies apply to have their technology uh, installed on it. So as much as this is complex and great technology, we have lots of Canadian partners or, or not very knowledgeable people to work with you people if you're interested. And we whittled it down to a dozen companies and they're all now professionally integrated into the car. You'll see things like embedded uh, alcohol detector, uh, gesture-based control of, of your uh, display. Uh, one of the more interesting things here today is a service where that first responders can put out a, uh, say they want to warn cars in a particular area and the technology in the car will interrupt the radio or whatever and give people uh, an, aud an auditable message. Where does an audible message stand in driver distraction? Um, should we all just ignore it and say it doesn't apply? Or should we recognize that that's okay or maybe there's certain parameters? NHTSA is starting to look at that, but there's it's things we should consider. I will warn you, uh, the software in the car is hard-coded for volume, and we can't turn it down. So. <laughs> 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 so I apologize if you're walking by the car and are startled, or if you're sitting in it and somebody else turns it on, but uh, it, it is effective, so it's a good display of how very simply, by taking the right approach, we can start to improve safety. So there's a number of things in the vehicle. These are all for automotive parts people. Now we look to show this vehicle to car companies today to get them to buy stuff six, eight months from now. It may show up in cars three years from, from now or four. Uh, the chairman of Toyota North America loves it. Says, can't get it down to my group soon enough. You guys actually got to see it before their, their uh, R&D shop. But we have every major car, every car manufacturer who has an engineering facility in North America has requested to see the car within the next three months. Uh, they're pleased that uh, a group uh, has been able to bring so many technologies together and show them in a useful way, as opposed to just show up, here's my part on the table, uh, please buy some, and, and stuff like that. QNX has done a marvelous job of integrating. So that's all I have to say. Back to, back to you. Well, you, you all tied for the gold medal. <laughs> <laughs> it's amazing. Thank you so much, and now we will give the Speakers, a round of applause. <laughs> and, I, and I do apologize for um, pushing you along, uh, but we did have to make up for the for the uh, for the late start. Uh, so we will we will open the floor up for questions now. Uh, for all three speakers combined, if if you have generic questions that each of them could answer in turn. I think that would be a good, uh, good idea. Uh, we will not have time to go and find the slides again if you want to, uh, uh, to, to identify a slide and direct your question surgically. We won't have time for that. So um, we will, um, I invite people to use the mic in the, uh, the middle of the floor and identify yourself and state your question and we'll have these speakers address them in turn. So, they know? Thanks, Cash. Um, I guess my question is for Barry. Uh, you talked uh, in the early part about some of the savings in terms of life savings as well as, as repair costs, fuel costs, savings, and so on. Is there a magnitude of what it will cost? I mean, this isn't coming free either. 
for the installation of all the equipment and so on is what you're talking about? Um, no, I'm talking about, I mean, if we're going to invest into the infrastructure uh, and into making this work, uh, there's going to be some cost there. When we talk about the savings, but what about the, the what, what kind of magnitude of investment is required? I had a conversation with some colleagues at uh, IBM, and in the, uh, the the area of the savings over uh, health and medical alone, it's about 10% of the cost of the health savings to put in the infrastructure to do this. Okay, thank you. Okay. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, my question is for any of the three, three gentlemen. Um, there, of course, these applications are going to generate uh, lots of data, uh, and a lot of pri uh, personal information will be carried over. Who, uh, in the various business models, uh, who will that information belong to? In other words, would an integrator of technology could use that data for commercial applications, for instance, using the metadata. So what's, has there been any thought regarding uh, the control and safeguard of data that will be generated by these uh, technologies? Um, a few points there. Uh, even in insurance telematics today, where insurance companies in other jurisdictions own the data, Canada is unique in the world in that the driver owns the data. And the world is watching now because it's setting up uh, intermediaries to own the data so that you can take it and move it from uh, insurance provider to insurance provider. And there's lots of security on that. Coming back to the US DOT program, I would say a good third of the work uh, in the design of everything has been associated with, with both privacy and security. And by security, I mean cybersecurity, that somebody doesn't hack it and create traffic jams. Uh, like they've done even with in-road sensors, people have put up things to spoof them and, and things like that. So, and there is, uh, there are in certain places in the, the architecture, the car manufacturer can have access to certain data and they, they can keep it secure. A local agency can act, have access to certain data. By and large, most of the data for, for agencies is, uh, will have like rotating numbers. So you can't even, even just with, with the number being registered, you can't even track a car basically from intersection to intersection. It's not quite that severe, but there is a lot of work gone into it in terms of hashing the data and making sure that even by behavioral patterns, yet alone by data hacking, uh, that, it, that it can't be tracked. But it, it will be ongoing, because every time we develop a new app, there'll be new data that somebody wants it, and then, of course, somebody will say, well, I'll only do it if I get the value out of the data. Otherwise, I have to charge, and nobody wants to pay for it, so the application never makes its way to market. So it'll be a moving thing. I just, the architecture is in there to make everything anonymous. If you guys decide that's what you want to do. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, I think I know all of the speakers pretty well. I'm Susan Spencer. Um, and I have a question. I, kind of relates back to the question we had on cost a little bit earlier where um, I think it, the question in my mind was really more about what, what does it mean for uh, implementing the infrastructure part of um, connected vehicles and autonomous vehicles and now automated vehicles I think is the term that's uh, frequently being used in the United States. Um, it, it seems to me that we're talking about a whole level of different kinds of investment that have to take place here. One is what takes place in the car itself, and I think, Barry, you, you've talked about that a fair bit and all the exciting things that are happening there. And so the auto manufacturers are probably going to take that on in terms of actually putting it into the car. But it, it's the other systems that become the critical safety ones um, for that collision avoidance and so forth that um, I guess is the real question outstanding in my mind of what the cost is and then what do regulators really have to think about all of that. Um, and, and so I, I guess, you know, are there traffic signals that have to be changed? Are there um, other things, roadside inf infrastructures that have to be put in place um, to be able to make both connected and automated vehicles or autonomous vehicles to work properly? And I think as regulators, I, I, my question to you, each of you is what, what, 
would a regulator need to know and really be worried about in each of your areas of interest? I think, Bob, you talked about this quite a bit, but, you know, Bowen and Barry, you know, there are uh, quite a number of issues that the technology will need to deal with and that regulators will have to really think about in terms of where they want to go into the future and, and requiring certain things to, to happen. Thank you, Susan. Yes, very good points, in fact. One of the things that uh, hasn't been addressed yet is the overall uh, source of the funding that's going to come to put these infrastructures into play. And right now, um, Canada by itself has an infrastructure deficit of $165 billion. We've underfunded our infrastructure across the country and roads and bridges and everything else by $165 billion. That's chronic underfunding by the government in what we need to have as a society. What we can do to help ourselves get out of that is have a new kind of alliance with the private sector in the PPP sense, or public-private partnership, that can bring this kind of funding into play. And one of the things I'm uh, happy to be working with in iCanada is uh, pilot projects and experiments with communities to see what we can do mm -hmm. to find new funds to fund public projects that wouldn't otherwise be funded. And that goes all the way from hospitals to, mm -hmm. as you're saying, the vehicle infrastructures. Um, there was another point I was trying, I was going to start trying to make Susan, and it's totally gone now, so it's uh, one of those old, old age things you hear about, but if I, can, if I can think about it, I'll get back to you. Oh, I was going to say, that's right, Internet of Things. You brought it up well. Um, we've all heard of the Internet of Things, and what it means is that everything out there is becoming a smart device. The traffic signals are, will be smart. The lights in this room will be smart. Each light bulb will be connected individually to the Internet so that each one is capable of being turned on and off by itself and they'll all be um, flowing as, as bits of data over the internet. Uh, so when it comes to how do we think about the future, this is an infrastructure that is needed um, and will be funded by the computer industry and the entertainment industry and the gaming industry. Uh, there, uh, almost every uh, moving forward facet of the knowledge economy is going to be pouring billions into this because the um, information, uh, the, the uh, intelligent city side of it alone in the next few years is a market worth a trillion dollars. This is where it's going and that's the kind of funding that will be provided. So. Yeah. I guess I, I don't know where the money's coming from. Um, but I do have a little bit of information on, on, on how I see things are going, particularly what Susan talked about, the infrastructure side. One of the examples I used earlier about traffic signal priority, when you've got a, a police car approaching an intersection or you've got a, a transit vehicle approaching an intersection, they tend to use proprietary different technology to communicate with a controller. So one of the things which has been developed is standards, and if the vehicle manufacturers start imp implementing that in the vehicles, and I don't know, Bob, you may comment on that later, but uh, if they start implementing infrastructure in vehicles for vehicle-to-roadside communication, then it's, I think it's imperative, in my opinion, that the policymakers start mandating that infrastructure be installed in traffic signal controllers as well. And change the message signs and, and lane control signs and all the other infrastructure. And the incremental cost is not significant. The problem is that like traffic signal controllers last 10 years, seven to 10 years, and they cost 10 grand. So you're not gonna change it overnight. And my experience being with municipalities and, and provincial funding agencies in Transport Canada, there is not a lot of infrastructure money available to go and do a massive upgrade. So it's got to be done incrementally, but I think it's important that when projects are implemented that they adapt the standards which are being adopted internationally and nationally as well to sort of take advantage of that momentum. And I think that's where the benefit comes, to get more bang for the buck. Um, so as I said, I don't really know where the money's going to come from. Um, I, I can't see entertainment industries providing funding for traffic signal controllers, with all due respect. It's all mobility. <laughs> yeah. Right. That's, that's all it is. Okay. So <laughs> I guess that's my comment. Yeah. Um, I have a few comments, uh, a little bit all, all over the map. I, one of the things, uh, the car industry's uh, enthusiasm for the uh, autonomous vehicle is because they get to do it on their own. They don't have to wait for infrastructure so much to catch up that the smarts are in the car. 
And so that alone, and besides that, it catches the public attention more. So as much as it's a lot more technology and a, a, a little further out, and I won't say a lot by any means, uh, it's gathered more momentum from that perspective. Uh, it's, yeah, it's sexier, it catches the attention. Now, the good thing about connected vehicles is they started all the policy work five years ago, and maybe it'll be in place by the time autonomous vehicles get on the road uh, in various places, but it's coming from a number of sides. When I first got into, or into connected vehicles in 2006, the plan of record was that we're going to do poof 400,000 traffic signals in the U.S. We're going to spend $20 billion. Isn't that wonderful? Well, nobody who had the $20 billion was saying that. It was all other people spending other people's money. Uh, so not even those people say anymore that we're going to upgrade every signal and do it in that way. But there are standards. Uh, they have been used at the pilot. And you know, this come back to being practical. I think in our jurisdictions, we should look at those standards and we should say any new signal bought after the end of 2015 or whatever, so that we are doing it in the normal course of business. Let's not wait till 2018 or so. It, it's going to be a few hundred dollars per intersection. The big part is the labor when you're doing the controller and everything else. So I think if we do that on a practical basis, we'll do well. We're also seeing certain jurisdictions, I, I was part of... Uh, and why I you know, harp on the standards a bit, I was at one of the US DOT meetings and some of the states stood up and said, look, we'll pay for it ourselves. We got certain areas like around the Los Angeles Harbor area and all that stuff, we gotta do something, this helps, we'll pay for it ourselves. We well, just get the standards in place so I don't lose my job by buying the wrong thing. So I, I don't think it's a big bang thing, I don't think it needs to be a big bang thing, it needs to be very deliberate, let's get on the standards and by the way, those same standards for sing signals are approved and the automotive manufacturers have been part of the standards process. So they, those standards will be going into cars, not back to the, the same proprietary uh, world that we had in, in, in previous technologies. Thank you. If I might just add something to what, uh, I know you're anxious to get out, but what, uh, what Bob was saying, uh, to point out that uh, the people who are providing the infrastructure now are, are not the traditional providers of infrastructure, it's Google that's making the autonomous car, for example. It's high tech that's doing these things. Um, if you put uh, the, the face to the Facebook, for example, uh, Facebook just got bought a company for billions of dollars called WhatsApp. Facebook is after the next billion people, the next four billion people, in fact, in the world because this technology reaches into the heart of Africa to do these things. People are not able to wait anymore. The companies that are on the edges are pushing into the center to take over. In the Intelligent Community Forum, for example, in the past 12 years, the, company, the cities that have won the, the award for most intelligent community have all had to build their own telecom systems. None of them were using a telco as currently understood. They had to do something that was simple, fast, cheap, and they did it themselves. That's the kind of thing, and, and sort of a revolution in infrastructure costs that you're gonna be seeing. Just thought I'd throw that in. I know you're all, I know we're getting to the end of our time here. I have a Rome, question. Rome has a very last question. I Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. I'm exercising my executive privilege today. <laughs> I'll ask my question of Bob because um, Bob comes from the parts industry. And my question is perhaps a little bit naive, but I'll ask it anyway. Uh, I understand conceptually the vehicle-to-vehicle -vehicle part of, of uh, connected vehicles and intelligent transportation systems. I don't really understand the vehicle-to-infrastructure piece and why we need to invest in infrastructure. If all of this technology is in cars and they can communicate with one another, we have communications networks that can gather the data ship it wherever it needs to go for analysis and then back to the vehicles um, for traffic analysis and all that. I, I don't really understand the infrastructure piece of it and why we have to spend so much money on infrastructure. I wonder if you could help me out with that. Uh, sure, Rob. The, um, and I'm a big believer in that each of autonomous vehicle, connected vehicles are a spectrum and within that there's lots of little parts. and, and we don't have to wait for big lumps to, to move forward. 
Uh, certainly in terms of traffic monitoring, and I'll call it near time, so plus or minus a minute. Uh, my personal view is we don't really need any infrastructure, that we can pull that information out and get it back to people. Now, I'd like to see it faster than the commercial apps are currently doing. I'm one of those people who always gets on 401, and I shouldn't have. I find out five minutes later that the bar turns from green to red uh, on my device. So I think we need to do a better job. But I agree with you, for those, we don't. The whole thing, uh, that's still vehicle to infrastructure, though, because the, the information is coming from outside. The, an agency or a, a company has assembled the information and brought it to you. And I think we're going to see that progress uh, increasingly towards you know, some level of active traffic management, even, where you can uh, either crowdsource or with very simple monitoring devices get enough information to act in a near-term time. The real uh, item for costly infrastructure are things like traffic signals, where you, you want sub-second response time and things like that, where it's real, real-time safety. And you know, if I go back to 2006, the view was that we wanted to poof, do everything all at once. And even at US DOT now, which is they're proving in real-time safety at intersections, which would be costly to, to upgrade every intersection, they're saying, let's get the vehicle to vehicle out there first. It's, even if we did embark on doing those 400,000 traffic signals, it would take us more than a year or two to get there. Uh, so let's get the vehicle to vehicle stuff working. And we do have jurisdictions who may not invest in infrastructure. We have some like California who are demanding it. Uh, so it's not a one solution fits all. And I kind of agree with you, Rob, that there's, we don't need to wait for that. We don't need to make it happen. And my own view is that we should just look to do it in the normal course of business as we're upgrading technology uh, out there, not try to make it a big, expensive big bang, but focus on getting the V2V first, because that's actually, in terms of safety, that's where the big mileage comes anyway. Now, <clears throat> we'll kind of take stock of time. I have... I have 4.20, so we, we are 20 minutes over, but on the other hand, the preceding session before you, you got here did take a little longer than expected, and, and we started later to, to get to, to allow people to have coffee and come into the room. So here's what we're going to do. Um, uh, for first of all, thank you to our speakers again, so another round of applause, uh, if you wouldn't mind. So, there's a token of our appreciation. Colin. Okay, now you are aware that there is another session uh, this, um, this afternoon after the coffee break. We will break for coffee now. And uh, let's, let me suggest uh, 20 minutes. So if we could have people back by 4.40 or, or thereabouts, I think that's, that's fair. A little bit later than that's fine. This is the last session. It will be the last session of the day. And, and there is, a, there is a, um, a, an event um, in, in the evening. Um, uh, following the, the last business of the day. Uh, so, I, um, okay, where is it? Okay, here we go. And the last session is entitled The Future of Safer Vehicles, Self-Driving Cars and Us. I'm guessing that a lot of people in the room here are lo likely going to be back for that session. So I'll give you about um, 20 minutes from now. I'd request you to bring your coffee back. It might hasten the, the start of that, uh, that last session, concurrent session. Thank you again. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Appreciate it, and thank you for your indulgence. Sorry about that. We're going to try to get the three.